Praise God. We're going home. Hey Amen. You may be seated. Praise Lord. Yes, I need that. Praise Lord. Amen. Hey man, things are, are happening fast in Madison, Wisconsin. If you were here in this service, you know what I mean, you know, I'm talking about. But be much in prayer for Madison, Wisconsin, as um, the Lord continue to move in a mighty way in each one of uh, those that are here, their hearts, those that are listening, are there at Facebook, YouTube, I'll continue to pray for us. Um, those that are here um, in Madison, Wisconsin, those that attend this church, um, it is time to come on back. Praise God. It's time to come on back. We are social distancing here. We do have masks, um, as we shared earlier um, on 
uh, this morning. If uh, there's not enough room, we will be uh, in the hallway, whatever we got to do um, to get the message out and to have you here in service. Amen. Praise God. So pray for us as we pray for you. Amen. Don't forget our uh, upcoming uh, service times on um, Tuesday, Tuesday Bible study um, at 6.30, 6.30. Also Thursday evening midweek service at 6.30. Also, we do have a prayer meeting here at noon Saturday. Come, come, come pray with us. And also back here Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock. This time, we're going to receive an offering tonight. You give as unto the Lord, as Brother Joshua come and help us. You give as unto the Lord, and the Lord will richly bless you. And all Christians do pay tithe and cheerfully give in offerings. Brother, could you please pray? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your giving. The Lord will richly bless you. Amen. Tonight we're going to be reading out of the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It is good for all of us to be here tonight. We'll say we appreciate everyone that's here, your faithfulness to the Lord. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning to read in verse 20. One verse of scripture tonight. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by someone else. No, it didn't say that. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Tonight, we'd like to preach on a thought or message titled, comfort in his promises. Comfort in his promises. Let us pray. Brother Josh, could you pray all the way back there really loud? Amen. Praise God. People just don't know what goes on in the background. <laughs> comfort, and there is comfort in his promises. The other day, I was driving on the highway to work, and it started to rain very hard. It was raining so hard, I can barely see out of the windshield. I sent up a prayer. Hope that's what you do. Some of us. I sent up a prayer under my breath about God protect me. And as I continued driving, the rain began to slow down and clear up. 
And in the distance, there was a rainbow over the sky. I immediately thought of Genesis chapter 9, verse 14 and 15, where it said, And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall be no more, excuse me, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. I felt comfort as that promise of God came ringing in my soul that morning. And the Lord impressed it upon my heart to preach on the thought titled Comfort in His Promises. There's a uh, brother here, he sometimes shares uh, some messages that God gives him wherever this that, and it's a comfort to me. I'm like, man, I'm going to write that down. The brother goes, hey, you were preaching my message. <laughs> There's comfort in the word of God, and especially in his promises. 2 Corinthians, as I just read, chapter 1 and verse 20, says, For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. In God, there is no wavering between yes and no. Jesus Christ was the premier example of this. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Jesus is the embodiment of God's faithfulness. Because Jesus Christ is faithful, Paul, messenger appointed by Jesus, would also be faithful in his ministry. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. His earthly ministry is, a, is an example of God's faithfulness to his people. God promised he would provide a savior, and he did. Christ obediently and faithfully said yes to God and his great promises. We open our Bibles at a promise. We look up to God, and God says, you can have all through Jesus Christ. Trust in Christ, we say amen to God. God speaks through Christ, and we believe in Jesus Christ. Christ reaches down and faith begins to stretch up and every promise of God is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. In and through him, we appreciate and take them to ourselves and say, yes, Lord, I trust you. Paul said at the latter end of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, he said, to the glory of God by us. All of this to the glory of God by us. One man wrote, he is glorified when it dawns on human souls that he has spoken good concerning them beyond their utmost imaginings. And when that good is seen to be undutably safe and sure in his son. The two words by us remind the Corinthians that it was through the preaching of men like Silvanus Timothy and Paul, that they had ever come to claim the promises of Jesus Christ. His promises resound constantly and loudly in Scripture. The Lord promised Abraham. He promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 in verse 1 through 3. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. Make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Great lives are trained by great promises. The promise to Abram. Number one, it throws light on the compensations of life. Uh, two, it shows the oneness of God with his people. And three, it shows the influence of the present over the future. There will always be central figures in society, men of commanding life uh, around whom other persons settle in the secondary positions. This one man, Abram, he owes the promise. All the other persons in the company hold it 
secondarily. God, God's promises are comforting because they also should not be neglected. When, it, when God to Abraham, when he told Abraham to move, he moved. This passage tells me that Abram was under no illusions as to what he should do. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I believe Abram moved because he believed what God had promised him. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 through 3, I'm sharing the I will. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's hardly necessary to point out the force of the repeated I wills of this passage because they introduce promises of eternal consequences, worldwide scope, and monumental import. This man who was to become a great nation could not at that time be the father of even one child. But God had promised. In marked contrast to a world that had come to ruin because it insisted on making a name for itself independently of God, this obscure man's name was to become great because God was promising to bring it to pass. To a man embarking on a perilous journey that involved famine and threats on his life, God promised unique support and encouragement even to the extent of accepting full responsibility for Abram's well-being. And now, the God who had promised to bruise a serpent through the seed of Eve, sharpened the focus on his revelation and showed that it would be through Abram that blessing would come to the whole world. Praise God. This revelation of God's part necessitated recognition on Abram's part. In some way, that's uh, not described to us in Scripture. Abram arrived at the necessary conclusion as Romans chapter 4 and verse 21 states. It states, and being fully persuaded that what he promised, he was able to also perform. On that basis, he moved in faith. It is on this same basis, a real bona fide child of God moves by faith. Did you know something tonight? We cannot even tie our shoes without faith. Huh? Really? It takes belief in God. Everything that we do, belief in the Christ that saves us. Just like Abraham, they are fully persuaded that what he has promised, he will also perform. God comforts us with the promise he would be good to us. In Psalm chapter 145 and verse 9, the Bible says the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are all over his works. God's tender mercies are all over his works. <laughs> if you look at those that are saved, look at those God's, God's mercies all over them. You say, well, preacher, you know, this is going on, that's going on. God's mercies are still all over you. God's mercy is all, all around, wrapped all around you. Why? You say, well, your situation could even be worse, sir. Worse. Says Walt said, it's no such word as worser. <laughs> you, you sit in the search, says Walt says, worse. Thank you, Sister Walt. Your situation can be worse. But I'm here to let you know that God's hand of mercy is wrapped around you tonight. The Lord is good to all. He maketh his son to shine, or excuse me, his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. He wouldeth not the death of a sinner, but rather 
that he may turn from his wickedness and live. And his tender mercies or compassions are not only over his human creatures, but all over his works, all that he has made, animals as well as men. Psalm 84 and verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. While the Old Testament normally avoids identifying God with the sun because of pagan, especially Egyptian religion, John in the book of Revelation sees the face of Jesus shining as the sun at full strength. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16 it says, and he had his right hand seven, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Perhaps no other object in nature has so many attributes that fit to represent a supreme and invisible source of power and life and government as the sun. Consider what an image of abundance the sun affords. Sunlight not only bears light for guidance and heat, but has a stimulating and developing power. The sun exerts creative energy. All things require the sun. The whole life of the animal in the vegetable kingdom waits day by day for the ministering care and stimulus of the sun. And this is most noticeable an image of that presence and power and nursing influence which resides in our God. The sun is the center of attraction, the holding force of the universe. Its invisible power harnesses all planets and stars. So God is the center of all power. God does not promise to give everything we think is good, but he will not withhold what is permanently good. He will give us the means to walk along the paths, along his paths, but we must do the walking. Everybody sometimes want um, God to do everything, but you got to do something. Faith without works is dead. Is dead. You got to do something. When we obey him, he will not hold anything back that will help us serve him. My pastor made a statement one time. He said, you know some preachers? He said, the Lord honors your prayers. When you pray, the Lord will not hold anything back that will help you in your commission to him. In your mission, your commission to what he has you to do. Pray. And he will do it. He will not. It's just like you go, and, uh, I work on a job. So I go to the job and every uh, week someone comes to me and says, do you need anything this week? They're going to order any part that I want, anything that will help me do my job better. And you know something? That's what the Lord does with you. What do you need? Well, you know, uh, the smallest thing God will do. Just ask. He said, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open unto you. He will give us the means to walk along his paths. We got to do the walking. The promises of God comforts us in answering our prayers. Jesus didn't tell his disciples how to get a new chariot or Cadillac. He didn't tell them how to get a bigger house or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or even a higher paying job. He didn't tell his disciples how to get more of anything. He told them how to get rid of carnal tendencies addictions, habits, or propensities that made them fruitless. Contrary to what the name it and claim it preachers out there begin to say, or the mentality propagates, cross current to what the positive can 
confession school maintains, Jesus was not talking about accumulating worldly goods, but about destroying worldly gods. He wasn't telling his disciples to claim in faith that they would be given a vacation cabin on a mountain. He was telling them to get rid of the mountain altogether. God does not grant requests that violate his own nature or will. Jesus' statement was not a blank check. To be fulfilled, requests made to God in prayer must be in harmony with the principles of God's kingdom. He said, well, if I pray for God to bless me with a million dollars, will he do that? Maybe in time, when you get your heart and your mind correct. Because if you're asking God to bless you with a million dollars right now, I guarantee you, you can't handle it. Wow. How you know, preacher? Because you don't have a million dollars. <laughs> God can accomplish anything, even if it seems humanly impossible. The promises of Jesus to prepare a place he promised to prepare a place for each one of us in his father's house. No doubt the disciples were deeply distressed for uh, there in the upper room Jesus began to inform them of the troubling news that one would betray him that Peter would deny him and that he would have to leave them. Yet as the room fills with confusion, Jesus looked at his disciples and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Heaven is the key. According to an April 24th, 2000, Washington Post article, I'll begin it right down here, 88% of all Americans believe in a literal place called heaven. An important statistic because imagine what our society would be like if we didn't believe in heaven. A society that didn't believe in heaven would be obsessed with youth. Okay? They would spend hundreds and thousands of dollars trying to look and stay and feel young through plastic surgery, diets, and exercise plans. A society that did not believe in heaven would spend billions of dollars on life support systems to delay facing an unknown future. In a society that didn't believe in heaven, crime would soar without fear of eternal judgment. The theology of a society that did not believe in heaven would be based upon the here and now, on health and prosperity. Wait a minute. We are that culture. Because although our generation gives lip service to the idea of heaven, we do not live out the reality of heaven. Is heaven a reality to you tonight? John chapter 14, verse 1 and 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus spoke in here. He said, You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. There are a few verses in scripture that describe eternal life. These few verses are rich with promises. Here Jesus says, I am going to prepare a place for you. And then he says, I will come again. I'm coming back to get you. We can look forward to eternal life because Jesus has promised it to all who believe in him. Are you here tonight? Do you believe in him tonight? Although the details of eternity are unknown, why do you say that, preacher? Because I've never died and, and saw what eternity looked like. Have you? No. No one has ever died, not in this life that I know of, have died and 
came back and I've talked to them about it. Hey, how was it over there? I don't know. No one that I know have ever came back. Well, preacher, you know those old time preachers? Well, I didn't talk to them yet. We don't need to fear because Jesus is preparing for us. He's preparing for us and we'll spend eternity. We'll spend eternity with him. The greatest blessing of heaven will be our fellowship with Jesus continually. It's, it won't even be the splendor of the place. Just fellowshipping with the one that we pray to every day. Fellowshipping with the one that speaks to us, answers our prayers. The one that when we are afraid, he comforts us. The one where when we are weak, he strengthens us. I want to see his face. There are many more promises that the word of God shares. His, provi his provision for us. His protection of us. His guidance. His wisdom. His righteousness. His love. So many promises of God. Promises long life. We begin to uh, uh, serve him. There's all kind of promises of almighty God. We can find comfort in no that there is comfort in all the promises of God. The promises of God are yea. Yes. That's right. And amen. To the glory of God by us. It's by us. Believe the promises of God. Find comfort in them. As I was driving down that road and saw that, saw that um, the rainbow, I was shouting in the car. To be honest with you, I had tears in my eyes because the Lord's reminding me, I got you. Don't worry about it. I got you. No doubt the rain was coming down hard and the windshield wiper, you couldn't see on the road with that little small car I got. But Jesus is like, hey, don't worry about it. Read the word of God. Seek out his promises. Hold them dear to your heart. He loves you tonight. There is comfort in his promises. That's all about our heads tonight. Close our eyes and reverence to God as they come to the instruments tonight. For all the promises of God in him are yea. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. It's by us. We hold the key. When you read the word of God, he brings those promises back. When you meditate on the word of God, it helps you begin to bring that mind that Jesus had. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. When you meditate on the word of God, when you meditate on the teaching of the word of God. Sometimes I think about when I was going through Bible school and some things come back up that the teacher taught me. That was there. It comforts. It comforts me. A lot of things that people share in the past. Leaders, our leaders, and comforts us. The greatest leader that comforts me right now is Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for this opportunity to preach your word. Thankful tonight, God, for all that you're doing in the midst of your people. But Lord, we ask that you by your spirit take over this part of the service, Lord. Comfort. Heal. Accomplish your divine will in hearts and lives that are here tonight and those that are listening on social media. I ask this in Jesus Christ's holy name. 
Let's all find a place to pray. Spend a season of prayer with the Lord tonight. God bless you. He's good to all of us, all the time. He's a very good, good father. God bless you as our prayer tonight. And remember, take comfort in the promises of Almighty God. Let us close in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thankful tonight, God, for all that you have accomplished in this place tonight. God, as we leave this place tonight, God, protect each one. Bring us back at the appointed time, God. And Lord, that our hearts and our, our minds, God, would be ready to receive all that you have for us. Tuesday night Bible study. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you back here Tuesday.